I'm Dirk, Dirk Johnson, Yeshe Sanglam, student of Lamas. Uh, I've had a lot of opportunities in the Dharma. I've had some really great teachers, uh, which doesn't translate to me knowing much. It just means that I've had the opportunities, not that I've fulfilled them. Uh, and the same is actually true with Sanskrit. They've had one of the best teachers in the world, probably for Sanskrit. And I've done my best, but we'll see where I, where I can go with it here. Now, this uh, picture that I'm displaying, can everybody, can you see that in the temple too? Yeah, I hope. Uh, this is from, this is uh, from Gandhara, from, it's a Gandhara, uh, a piece from Gandhara. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Gandhara here. But this is a, a, a picture depicting, uh, a, this is a, a carved in stone, a stele, uh, probably carved into sh shits, <laughs> uh, which is a, 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 a kind of a very dark kind of hard stone. Uh, I don't know what the date of this is. Oh yeah, second or third century. CE. So actually, this is very close after the text that we're going to be talking about uh, was written. Uh, and it depicts the de it depicts the battle, Mara attacking, uh, Mara's troops attacking uh, the future Buddha, because he's still not the Buddha yet. Uh, he's, he's at his last stage here. And so just for uh, context this is gandhara so when we sing in the seven line prayer we say from the northwest border of the country of origin yeah that gandhara where it says gandhara there's about where it's talking about it's probably where um, your rinpoche was from the swat valley they say and in uh you can see you can see you've got iran afghanistan what now is pakistan and then india so uh, you know, on the third three, the 326 uh, BC, Alexander the Great came in there and conquered this area, uh, which is why, if we go back, you can see the influence of the Greeks on the robes, especially on the Buddha, and on the on the figures. All of that's very, very heavily influenced by their contact with the uh, with uh, the Romans and the Greeks. Anyway, so that's the context for that piece. And I promised to share a uh, reader, so I'm going to just quickly talk about what 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 that means. So this is uh, my reader, which I use for which I used the same picture. Uh, and I'm going to show the bookmarks for it here because I'm going to skip some of this stuff you know I wrote an introduction for it and everything but this is so this is the reader this is what if you're if you're if you want to read a Sanskrit text or when you're a beginning reader or an intermediate or an advanced reader you, you, you hope to find a text that's like this which gives uh, the Devanagri this is Devanagri script uh, it's that doesn't mean it's Sanskrit. You see here, like there, there, there's an error here, by the way. It's just, I'll point it out to you so you can't point it out to me. <laughs> but you see Vimoksha there. Um, well, this this says Tasmin Vimokshaya. Uh, Vimoksha is one of the is part of this first word there. It's not really a word. It's a couple of words. But Vimoksha is as much Sanskrit written in Roman script uh, transliteration as it is written in Devanagari. The reason we do it in the Devanagari is because if you aren't practiced in Devanagari, you have a hard time reading other manuscripts because most of the things that you can find in Sanskrit are written in Devanagari. And that actually goes back to, to British colonialism <laughs> because uh, the history of Sanskrit is that it was written in whatever script the locals used and they would use some kind of transliteration, but the Brits decided that Devanagari was the right script for Sanskrit. And since they colonized India and uh, ruled it for a long time, that's the way it is. 
now this also comes with so what, what this is is uh you know it's the verses and the vocabulary and the order of the verses and then so a little bit of ex explanation of some of the grammatical features of the verses also in the same order as the verses so that's that's the heart of what a reader is so if you see a textbook and it says it's a sanskrit reader that's what you're going to get the same would be true in latin or greek and then the, also of course they create a cumulative vocabulary so this says every word in the text and some notes uh and a transliteration of the text so this is the same this is ex no different from that devanagari it's exactly the same it's written differently uh devanagari is by tradition these two lines uh, these are four lines are called four padas each one of these is a verse or a shloka there's also a shloka meter which is a different thing uh but but each verse is called a shloka. And then, of course, my literal translation, which is what we will be working with today. We won't be working with Sanskrit, don't worry. Bibliography, and this isn't going to show very well because I re reversed the colors, but I also have a few tunes for the uh, different verses. So anyway, that's the reader. And so what is it a reader of? It's the reader of the 13th sarga or canto or chapter of the buddha charita um, the buddha charita was written by ashvagosha uh there are a lot of you know he's often referred to as a philosopher a lot of texts are attributed to him but really there are only three texts that we know for sure are from him and that's the buddha charita another uh, text called the samdara nanda which is translated usually as the handsome nanda it's a story about uh his conversion of his cousin and that's probably actually uh ashvagosha's later work the the buddha charita probably is earlier handsome nanda maybe a little more mature uh so literally it translates as the acts of buddha but it's the uh, frequently translated as the life of the Buddha. And it was probably written uh, somewhere in the, between the first and the second century AD. Uh, and it was translated in Chinese uh, in 414 and 421 AD. So pretty early even in the Chinese transmission. Then it was translated into Tibetan uh, in the seventh through the eighth century. And that makes it one of the earliest of all things that were translated into Tibetan from the uh, uh, Sanskrit Buddhist tradition. And it is also in the in the tradition in the Indian tradition, uh, there's a there's a I think we have conf another microphone on. There's uh, in, in the other uh, in the Sanskrit tradition, there is something called Mahakavya. And that is basically a written epic. So you have the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, and those are uh, epics that are similar in, in a way, in many ways, to say Homer's, you know, Iliad and Odyssey. Uh, so they're they're epic literature that come from an oral tradition, but then there becomes this tradition of uh, epics that are written, which is more like the. Virgil's Aeneid in our Western tradition, or even Milton's, say, Milton's Paradise Lost or Dante's Divine Comedy. Those are written epics. And this is the first extant written epic in the history of Indian literature. Uh, and it is the, so it's really important that way, just, to, just literarily it's important. But it's also uh, important because this was considered such a powerful poem and so it was such an important poem that it that it, scholars believe that many of the other texts that were written were rewritten to conform to this. So this is the story that dominated uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, India, Indonesia. Like this is the story that dominated all of Asia uh, because of its uh, it was considered to be so powerful. Now we only have the first 14 chapters of it in Sanskrit. 
We have the rest of it translated into Tibetan, and we have the rest of it translated into Chinese. But as the when when during the time of this, and I want to take I'm going to take you I'm going to try to take you back into time a little here, because in the time of this, when this was written, Buddhism was the dominant religion in the in the place in northern India and in the uh, Gandhara even uh, Buddhism was dominant and as time went on so by the time by the time it was translated into Tibetan the uh, the Vedic religions that we usually refer to as Hinduism had had taken over and sort of uh, you know pushed uh, Buddhism to the periphery except mainly like in pockets way in the north northeast and stuff there the buddhism was still there uh, but it was mostly pushed out of india by the time it went to Tibet. and then of course the it was funny finished off or in, when the when nalanda was destroyed and everything anyway so this poem is very important we only have 14 chapters of it in uh, sanskrit so now I'll talk about the author. I, I usually a little resistant, but but there's not much known because especially with Sanskrit authors, because almost nothing's known about almost any of them. No, they just wasn't considered important who the person was that wrote it. Uh, they they just didn't think it was that important. But he was likely a native of uh, Saket, Saketa, which is an interesting thing because Saketa is also named for Ayodhya, and Ayodhya. Unfortunately, this map goes to about China, uh, but Ayodhya, which you see uh, over Pakistan is what we were looking at before, because that's Gandhara, Gandhara. It's not, not to be confused with the Gandharvas, which are a different thing. This is Gandhara, and Ayodhya is also the birthplace of Rama. This is written, so in the Ramayana, Ayodhya is uh, very important. Uh, it's also probably Buddha and Mahavira, uh, the uh, the uh, founder of uh, Mahavira, the founder of uh, Jainism, uh, both taught at various times in, uh, well, Saketa is what the Buddhists called it, but Ayodhya is the name that, it, that survived in the uh, uh, Vedic traditions. Uh, so that's probably where Ashvagosha was born and grew up. He was probably uh raised as a brahmin so he was probably originally raised uh because you can say that he was probably a brahmin because he was so uh highly accomplished in sanskrit uh, and in the in the uh vedic tradition that it you know kind of indicates that he he was raised in it he was taught as uh, uh from a childhood he was taught that tradition and so he probably converted to buddhism uh, as an adult. What's interesting about one of the things that he does, and you'll see it, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit when we get to the poem shortly. Don't worry, I won't go on too long about this. Uh, but he he subverts the Vedic tradition a little bit. He takes it and he plays with it and he toys with it. He makes fun of it. He, 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 he reinterprets, he changes the meanings of things. And this is something that Buddhism did because Buddhism, Buddhism did not accept the Vedas. Uh, Buddha did not accept the Vedas as, as being, uh, as, as being the truth. <clears throat> so there we have those guys now. Okay. So. This is just a picture of Buddha under the Bodhi tree, but they got to think this is this is the story. The story is, you know, he's born to great fanfare, of course, he 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 lives. He lives a life of just he, he's, he's so uh, he lives a life of great luxury, great freedom. He, he's 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 uh, I don't know if you the, the, the tradition is that he was a prince. He's anyway, he was an arist aristocrat, at least he was. He was very, very well off. He was uh, tr pampered, treated beautifully. And then he just got, you know, the, the story they, of course, they show the story is that he sees, he sees a, a sick person. He sees a dead person. He says, oh my God, we're going to die. He sees an old person. He says, oh, we're going to get old. He sees a sick person. Oh, we're all going to get sick. Uh, but personally, I see it more as a process that happened, uh, that he came to a full realization that death indeed 
was going to happen to everybody that he knew and to himself and that he was looking for a way out of it. So he left the palace and he became an ascetic because at the time, that's what they did to find the truth. They became ascetics. He wanted to become an ascetic. He went and studied with uh, the great teachers of the day who taught him taught him how to meditate, uh, to do shamatha meditation in great depth. And he, 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 he became a complete master of samadhi and shamatha meditation. And he determined that that was not going to free him. That was not going to live. That wasn't the path to liberation. And he left those teachers and he became an extreme ascetic. He went and did things like, you know, eating one grain of rice a day. Uh, torturing his sitting in the sun, standing on one leg, that kind of stuff. I, we don't know exactly what he did. He did that. Those are the sort of ascetic practices they do. You know, wearing, not eating, wearing, wearing bad clothing that's actually hurting to wear it. Sitting in postures that are extremely uncomfortable. And then he was pretty close to dying. And uh, a, a young girl offered him a bowl of uh, a bowl of uh, rice pudding basically I guess. Uh, and he ate it and when he ate it he he he, he at, at, the, at the same time he he decided that asceticism wasn't not, also wasn't going to liberate him so first he tried uh, shamatha just focusing on one object liberated tried that didn't work then he tried asceticism that didn't work and finally when uh the he had five he had five companions who were also ascetics and when he ate that bowl of rice they're like hey man you know we're we're done with you what the hell what's what's going on you know you just what are you doing you're eating rice we're supposed to be finding liberation through this ascetic practice what so they abandon him so he's all by himself now. And he goes, he says, okay, this is it. I'm going to sit down here. I'm going to sit under this tree until I'm liberated. And so that's where our story starts. The one we're dealing with right now. And so he promised, this is his vow. I am going to sit here and I am going to be liberated. And so, uh, mind you, this is my translation is meant to be very literal. I follow the order of the Sanskrit like locked up kind of so it's not meant to be literary at all but when this promise made for liberation by a great sage arisen from a lineage of wise kings was being fulfilled in that place the world rejoiced but mara enemy of the true dharma was afraid feared and so there's a little tune does mean vimachaya kata pratijne rajar she was some prabhavi maharshao tatro pavishte prajahar shalokas tatras the sadamari pustu marak. So I'm not going to make you sing it. You can if you want to, though. So, who is Mara? And remember, even in the in in the the uh, Archid Lamsa that we just did, um, oh, we want to overcome the Maras, right? <laughs> so here we go. You know, Mara, who who Mara, who in the world is declared as the god of desire, and he's got a colorful bow, whose bow is colorful, whose arrows are flowers. He's the commander of the manifestations of longing, and they call him Mara. The freedom hater. Yam kama devam pravadanti loke chitra yudum pushparas pasaram tataiwa kama prachara dipatim tamewa moksha divasam maram udaranti. Well, I botched that one. Anyway, so the story continues. Now I'm going to skip verses. I'm not going to do this whole thing for with you this way. Don't worry. So uh, this sage, bearing the armor of resolution, 
this is Mara, Mara's thinking. The sage bearing the armor of resolution, drawing the bow of reality and the arrow of understanding. Mind you, Mara has this pretty little bow with the colorful flowers like Cupid. Continues striving to conquer my realms. From this, my spirit is downcast. I'm left out. I, maybe I shouldn't have left out that verse. The other verses, his children came to him and asked him why he was bummed out. So that's why. If indeed, having conquered me, he goes and declares the path of liberation to the world, then my realm will be suddenly empty. I love that, that his realm will be empty. That's indeed it, right? Like the master of Videhas when he went haywire. That's just a that's a that's a reference to a king who lost his mind, destroyed his kingdom. As long as he hasn't reached this insight, he's still on my cattle ranch. And that's almost that's a literal translation from the Sanskrit. It's like his his cow patch, you know, something like that. As long as he hasn't reached this insight, he's still on my cattle ranch. I'll go break his vow like a swollen river a levy. Um, yeah, man span that if you're really translating it to say it's like a river does a levy uh then so then then having grabbed his bow that injures with blossoms and five arrows that make the world foolish he approached the bodhi tree with his children who breeds disease in people's minds he who breeds he who breeds disease in people's minds then to the calm sage, the, the you know, the Shakyamuni, the future Buddha, no, he, he hasn't noticed any of this. He's just in deep meditation. Then to the calm sage remaining seated, seeking to cross the far shore of the ocean and becoming, holding the tip of, holding the tip in the bow with his left hand. Playing with an arrow, Mara said, Stand up, Mr. Death Fearing Warrior Lord. <laughs> he's just like he's mocking him. Now, at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, you have Krishna and Arjuna are in the chariot and they're in the middle of the two armies. And Arjuna is just like, I, I, I can't do this. I'm going to have to kill all my relatives. And and he sits down. He falls down. He's just totally dejected. He's just lying. He's sitting there. And and Krishna says to him, "Stand up, you stand up, Kshatriya." The, the Kshatriya is actually the word here. It's stand up, Mister Death Fearing Kshatriya. And then uh, our, that's exactly what Krishna says to Arjuna. So you can see right here, the, the Bhagavad Gita is being made fun of a little bit. It's it's like because stand up, Mister Death Fearing Warrior Lord. You follow your own dharma. This is what this is what Krishna says to Arjuna. Follow your dharma. You're you're a warrior. You're supposed to go out and kill these people. You know, leave this dharma of liberation. Mara says to the future Buddha, having tamed the world with arrows and sacrifices, you will take from the world. Indra Vatsabha's rank. In other words, if you if you leave this, you can become king of the world. You can become master of the world. So why are you wasting your time on this crap? Does that remind you? Like you, you know, I should meditate. Well, actually, I should go. You know, maybe I I should go do this, or I should go do that, or I should go do this. That's the voice of Mara. Don't do what you think you're supposed to do. That's a bunch of crap. Utishta bhokshatriya murtyu bhutta chara swadam mam tyaja moksha dharmam vanesh chayaj naish chavini lokam lokat padam prap nuhi vasavasya. I should have practiced that more, but anyway. Quickly, stand up, snap out of it. This arrow's here licking its chops. When this mistress, when their mistresses grip them in carnal delight, I won't shoot them, just as I won't shoot Chakravakras. So he's saying, Oh, you know, just go have some fun. I won't shoot you with my arrow if you're already having a good time with your with your women of the palace or whatever. So thus he spoke. And when disinterested, Shakyamuni didn't even change his pose. 
than reply to him, Mara shot and hid behind his daughters and son. <laughs> now, this actually goes back to another story, which is an important story in all in Hindu mythology, uh, and is covered in the Kumara Sambhava of Kalidasa, who is the next great poet after him, actually considered greater than Ashvagosha, but he follows Ashvagosha and depends on Ashvagosha and disagrees with Ashvagosha. But anyway, in the Kumara Sambhava, Mara is asked to shoot Shiva with the arrow to make him fall in love with Uma. And so that they can uh, have a child that will uh, conquer this uh, negative God that, a, that no gods or humans can conquer. So uh, no gods can conquer, I'm sorry. So, but when, 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 when Kama is about to shoot Shiva with the arrow, Shiva gets pissed off and looks at him and shoots flames that burns him up, burns him into ash. Uh, Kama, Kama does not even get his body back for a long time after this. So, but it's interesting. Shiva got pissed when he started aiming the arrow. What did Shak, what did the Buddha do? Didn't even notice. They have no mind, didn't even care. But when he shot the arrow, the Rishi neither cared nor veered from his vow. Having seen him thus, Mara was downcast and seized with anxiety. He whispered, when he was pierced by this toward Uma, even Shiva was diverted. Which is actually, there's a question, well, whether that's actually true. <laughs> but this guy, he doesn't even notice the arrow. Could he be heartless? And then, then is, isn't this the same arrow starting to doubt his own power? Fine. He doesn't deserve the flower arrow. Not even an erection. No use trying sex. He only deserves, by disgusting demon gangs, beatings, shaming, and terror. And so, you know, he, he gave up on, 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 this is the seduction scene. Usually you see, most of the stories you've probably seen have, have Mara putting girls up to Buddha and Buddha ignoring them. This is, this is really, this is the truth here. But when Mara recalled his own army, all Mara had to do was think of his army, and it was there. Wanting to, to destroy Shakyamuni's tranquility, his variously shaped henchmen closed in around him, brandishing spears, trees, javelins, poisons, diseases, and swords. And that's what that, that's what that picture is, right? <clears throat> Whose faces were boars, fishes, horses, donkeys, and buffalo. Living tigers, bears, lions, and elephants, some one-eyed, I, I can play one of these roles, some one-eyed, multi-mouthed, or three-headed with distended bellies and speckled bellies, whose thigh bones are knees and whose knees are water jugs, whose weapons are tusks and whose weapons are claws, whose mouths are heads and whose bodies are multiple, whose faces are torn in half and whose mouths are gigantic. Anyway, this goes on for quite some time. So I'm going to skip some of it. But the great Rishi, because he, he really goes, this is oh, Hieronymus Bosch could have painted this one. But the great Rishi, seeing Mara's army intent on disrupting his accomplishment of Dharma, he wasn't desert, disturbed. He didn't even flinch like a lion lying among cows. Then Mara, so then Mara's like, okay. Mara ordered his hopped up demon army to scare him. Each of his troops by his own powers re resolved to shred his tranquility. And here follows for a while. Uh, you can see I skipped him, uh, quite a few of them already, but one by one, he's got people, he's got demons coming up and attacking uh, the seated sage, trying to disturb him. One blazing like the high sun from the sky poured out a great rain of burning charcoal like dust of the golden caves when marrow burns at the end of an eon. So that's the, you know, you, you're familiar with the kalpas and we're in the yuga kalpa. Well, at the end of an eon, Mara, I mean, Meru, which has four faces, one of the faces of Meru is golden and marrow explodes and 
it just turns into it to dust. So that's what this is. So, you know, like like dust of the golden caves when Miro burns at the end of an eon. But while scattering around the Bodhi tree, the raining charcoal with flaming sparks from the best Rishi's friendly disposition. I'm reading this badly. I'm going to start over. But while scattering around the Bodhi tree, the raining charcoal with flaming sparks from the best Rishi's friendly disposition, they became a cascade of red lotus petals. Then others appearing like lions and hyenas howled with great thunderous roaring from which creatures everywhere shrank, thinking the sky was hit by a thunderbolt, shattering. Deer and elephants poured out distressed howls and running away they hid as though that night were day. All around afflicted shrieking birds were fluttering. So nature is just freaking out. There's this gigantic battle happening and all of nature's just freaking out, even the sky and the sun. I'm skipping a lot of stuff here, but everything. Although with this kind of uproar, all creatures were trembling. The Muni didn't fear, didn't shrink away, like Garuda with the kind of crows. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to have to turn off my background. Yeah, and maybe I can't. If I hold it up to my face, me. There we go. That's Garuda. Garuda. Well, you know Garuda from the flight of the Garuda, maybe. Garuda represents the nature of mind, often thought of now by us as also being a wrathful form of Guru Rinpoche. But Garuda is an ancient symbol that even predates Buddhism. <clears throat> By however much the sage was not afraid of the circling gang of thugs trying to scare him, by that much more the enemy of practitioners, Mara, despaired from anguish and rage. Then some invisible god, this is never really explained, but this guy, this, some invisible god just starts talking. Uh, a preeminent being stationed in the sky. So he's just up in the sky, having seen his offense to the Rishi, his fury at tranquility. You know, why, why is this guy mad at the guy for being tra tranquil? <laughs> he spoke tomorrow with a booming voice. So the voice just starts booming from the sky, <clears throat> which, by the way, Buddha doesn't notice that either. <clears throat> Don't toil uselessly, Mara. Lay aside your nasty soul and go home. You can't make the shock you shake any more than the wind, the great heights of Meru. Fire could abandon this. This is, I think this is really interesting, this part here. Fire could abandon its character of heat, water, wetness, earth, solidity. But through many kalpas of acting well, he cannot abandon his resolve. So Buddha's karma is so powerful from, from so many lifetimes of creating good karma that he that it simply cannot be resisted by him or anyone else. It's 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 an in it's inevitable now. Because of which courage, power of resolution and effort, he compassionate toward being will not rise without grasping truth as the sun without dispelling darkness. So just as the sun can't rise without dispelling darkness, he will not rise without grasping the truth. For the blossoming of intentional acts he's accomplished, now's the established time. Sitting that way in this place, the same way as earlier sages. Remember, in our tradition, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha is the fourth Buddha of the fortune of Dion. There were infinite Buddhas before that. For this navel of the earth's surface has been endowed by all with the greatest power. So we're talking about Bodh Gaya now as the navel of the earth, and it's been endowed because all of the Buddhas have always achieved enlightenment at Bodh Gaya. Thus, on earth, there is not another place 
that could bear the impact of this intense meditation. So in some ways, this the, the, just the power of the meditation itself created all of this havoc in some ways. Because that's that because it's 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 like like the laws in physics that, that if you if you if you make a heavy motion in one direction, that much resistance is going to oppose it. This is this is something that the Buddhists recognized a long time ago. They weren't talking about material though, but that that this in, that powerful intention, powerful action, will result in powerful op, powerful opposition. The thrill gone. I, I left out some stuff here. He's got he's got Mara, you know, turning tail and slinking away. The power gone, toil made fruitless, stone burning straw and trees abandoned because they were throwing all they were throwing all this stuff at that Buddha. His troops fled hither and thither like a hostile army whose leader is killed. While conquered flower flag flees with his escorts. <laughs> I, had to, I, I didn't leave it as Mark as flower flag is like one of his epithets, but this is, you know, he's making fun of him. This is, is Ashwagosha is making, making fun of him. So I left it in there. While conquered flower flag flees with his escort, the great Rishi without dust defeats mental darkness. The sky was bright with the moon like a young girl laughing. And a fragrant calyx do flower rain fall. So that's that's the thirteenth chapter of Ashvagosha's Buddha Charita. As I <laughs> read it. <clears throat> so now, and now that I've talked for longer than I probably should have, anybody have any comments or questions or Nope. No. Huh? Hi, Dirk. This is Daniel. Um, thank you. That was awesome. I loved your singing. Uh, but I don't really so much have a question as I do a request. Is there any chance that you'd make that a uh, that reader available to us? Oh yeah, I'm. I'm going to do one more round of editing. I submitted it. Here's here's the thing. Of course, I submitted it for review by my teacher, and she'll she'll go through it. It's 72 pages, and I know she'll go through every page of it. And she'll give it back to me all marked up no matter what I do. But I submitted it, and, and then I looked at the PDF and went, oh, error, 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 error. So I found it, and I said to her, can I reset? Because she's in no hurry for it, really, because, uh, well, she has some external issues that are slowing her down. But uh, so she told me I could resubmit it. So after I correct the errors that I've found, I'll, I'll make it available and then I'll update it after I update it according to her comments. But yes. Thank you, Dirk. Oh, Ellen, I'm sorry. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say I hope you get an A because it's pretty incredible. I, I, I'm curious about how you expect it will compare with other students' works. And then the other observation I had that I really liked was that there was a dog in the car stone carving that you first showed. I wondered if that had any significance. I thought that was pretty cool. The dog? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know about the dog. The dog was cool. I've never seen dogs in carvings like that. Um, let's go back to it. He's almost front and center. I mean, if it was a cat, you would have noticed, but <laughs> since I'm a dog person, I noticed. See that head right there? I'm pointing, but you can't see me pointing to the left of his hand, his left hand. Which one is his left hand? The one he's holding up or the one that's down? The one he's holding up. Oh, I see it now. Yeah, I that was that is a dog, isn't it? I yeah, not... it's a happy looking, peaceful looking dog. I want to know what the story yeah, is. Yeah, but he so... might be trying to bite him. No, he's not trying to bite him. <laughs> anyway, well, this, this is, is the assault of Mara's army here. Oh, they, they do all look pretty peaceful, though, don't they? They do. Maybe they were wo wooed by him. 
Anyway, I, I mean, this is just incredible. Is this, do you expect this is sort of consistent with other students' works or you've really worked hard on it? Oh, other students? I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't speculate about that. Yeah. I just okay. did what I wanted to do. Yeah, super cool. I mean, so my, the other students are pretty high level, though. Uh, yeah. Some of them, I'm sure, did some pretty amazing work. Yeah, it's a, a spectacular. I aspire to be as skilled at ancient languages someday to live a long time. Well, you know, there's going to, they're going to, yogic studies is going to have a class in classical uh, Tibetan starting in September. Oh, really? I'd love to see the information yeah, for that. that. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this. All right, thanks. Uh, Jack. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Dirk. Um, yeah, that was that was really awesome. I also liked hearing kind of what I felt maybe were some of your um, a little bit of your voice. Um, even you know you said that there was kind of a direct translation, but there was also I think maybe some some personal voice in there too. Um, but my question is, I was wondering, um, like, how has this kind of doing this close reading? Um, and translation, how has that kind of affected your personal training and practice? Well, I, I, that's what I was talking about a little bit. I touched on it, the, just this, the, you know, Mara's army is attacking us every day. It's attack, I, I notice, I, I, it's, a, it's a metaphor that's been working better for me than it had been before. And that's the primary one. It's just this realization that, uh, the things that disturb my practice or disturb my my patience or dis disturb my ability to accomplish the six paramitas, let's say, uh, or, or 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 to rest in the nature of mind, whichever whatever level of practice it is at whatever time it is, because I don't know about you, but I practice at different levels all the time. I can never maintain the highest level. Um, but whatever whatever level of practice I'm in, whatever the obstacles are that I'm running into during them, it's it's Mara's it's Mara's army, and I don't need to go worried about it. I don't need to run from it. I don't need to hide from it. I don't need to fight it. I just need to just let it let it go. Just and not necessarily ignore it. I don't think I don't think I don't think this story is saying that Buddha that that. I don't want to call him Buddha because he wasn't Buddha yet. That the Bodhisattva, that the, the Bodhisattva ignored Mara. I think he just wasn't interested in Mara. And so that that not being interested, that disinterest, which is, you know, that's a really fundamental Buddhist thing, that disinterest. That disinterest in all of the things that the world thinks are the things that are the most important things is uh, well can be calmer, yeah. just in general, you know, just not 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 constantly being challenged in ways that you don't need to be challenged. Is that I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. Nobody in the temple has, has a, anything to say? Hi, Dirk. It's Jen. Hi, Jen. I had got, I have I love this so much. So I can't wait to to see the edition come out. And I have never heard of Mara described as um, having a a bow and shooting flowers. I mean, I think I've heard of it, like, but for some reason, like, and the thing with the girls approaching him, you know, that sort of thing. But, but it, what struck me was uh, that there's kind of a deity Kurukula. I don't know how to say say it, but she's a Dakini that has that flower bow. Oh yeah. Bow shoots flowers mm -hmm. and i was wondering um what well, is that like a sort of um like the two forces on opposite end one is sort of a physical desire and one sort of an intellectual desire or i, I don't know what do you what do you make of that I, I think what you're noting is the difference between sutra and tantra here uh this is this is a sutra text 
Uh, there's argument about whether Ashwagosha was a, a Mahayana or Theravada. Well, they don't. That it wouldn't be Theravada, but whether he was one of the schools that's not a Mahayana school. Uh, so what what Ashwagosha has done here, though, is to so so desire, especially in the in the pre in the non Mahayana schools, uh, desire is one of the is considered like the one of the primary obstacle. In the Vajrayana, we take desire and we use it. But in 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 the earlier schools, desire was something that was uh, seen as an obstacle. So this is desire as an obstacle here. And uh, uh, what Ashwagosha is doing is he's conflating the the Buddhist Mara with the uh, uh, Hindu, I don't, I don't like to say Hindu because it's like, although I guess it's okay. It, with, with the Hindu, with the Hindu Kama, Kama is the, they call him the god of love, but he's really the god of desire. It's you know, if you certainly you know the Christian love and Kama have nothing in common. <laughs> There's, for instance, I mean, he, he's he's the god of desire. He's, so he's very much more like Eros or Cupid, really. And so, you know, Kuro Kule, that's a whole different ball of wax. We're, we're, that's, that's the, that, that's a Tantra. That's a Tantric deity. Thank you so much. Uh, Elizabeth asked what Charita means. Uh, it means uh, act, act, actions. So it's the, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, tat purusha compound, meaning uh, the actions of the Buddha. Buddha charita, so charita, the actions of the Buddha. But it's usually also since it is also the life of the Buddha. Oh, the background that I've been using today. Uh, it's uh, oh, that's I've still got it on. Uh, that's just that's a site in Gan in Gandhara, <laughs> and since I used a piece of art that was discovered in Gandhara. And since most of the Gandhara excavations are pretty recent, because they didn't realize, it's only very recently, like since the 90s, that Gandhara has been realized that Gandhara had a huge Buddhist uh, population. And that, uh, Did you have a question? I see you have the mic, somebody with the mic. Oh, uh, yes, hi. Um... I'm kind of new to um, learning, but I have heard of terms such as Maya and Samsara. And I was wondering if Mara is would be similar to those, Maya and Samsara. Are those like equivalent or similar at all? Uh, they, they, they don't have any, uh, they're not, they're not from the same words. They don't have any kind of uh, semantic relationship. They're, they're, they have different sources. Uh, samsara is really a very, very old idea. It's an idea older than Buddha. Uh, it goes back to the Vedas. Uh, it's the cycle of existence. And that's part what 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 many say, if, if you read, there's a sutra called the Lalita Vishtara, which is a life of Buddha uh, also, which was probably influenced ultimately by this, but what Buddha, was, according to a lot of schools of Buddhism, what Buddha was seeking to do was to, be, to li become liberated from the cycle of birth and death. Now that can be interpreted in a whole lot of ways. So, but that's samsara. Samsara is this. It's it's not a place, you know. It's and it's not a person. It's not. It's not any. It's it, it's just a description of a process of of continual life, birth and death, uh, and that can be observed in from moment to moment. It can be observed from day to day. It can be observed from year to year, from lifetime to lifetime forever constantly happening this constant cycle but as one of my teachers uh, said he said uh, 
Kempo Sewang Jato, he said, this is your life. You're happy. You're sad. You're happy. You're sad. You're happy. You're sad. And then you die. And then you're reborn. And you're happy. And you're sad. And you're that samsara. So samsara and and now Mara and Maya. Maya is not really it. Maya is a uh, is, is illusion, illusion in, uh, and that's really a Hindu thing more than a Buddhist thing. But so maybe Maya, Maya and Kam and uh, Mara could be a little bit more closely related. But the words aren't related. The word the words are unrelated. Thank you. Hey Dirk, Dirk, it's Patty, and um. Patty, who? I just, uh, I just feel honored to be a part of this group here, that could hear this for the first time. I feel very honored, and how you um, just uh, brought this to us today, and all the effort you put into it is just uh, so amazing, so amazing. I had no idea that it was going to be like this today. But I should have guessed knowing you. <laughs> so, really, thank you so much, Dirk. Well, thank you, Patty. I'm glad you liked it. Dirk, it's Daniel again. I, I have an answer to Ellen's question about the dog. Uh, I think it has something to do with this saying that uh, dog is Mooney's best friend. Uh, uh, <laughs> dog is what? Mooney's best friend. Mooney's? Yes. Anyway, yeah. I was trying to make a joke. Um, I also have a question about uh, the gesture that's being made in the uh, image that you showed of the Buddha. He's like touching the, the ground or something. He has his hand down. Can yeah, that's you... earth touching a gesture. Yeah. Could you speak to the well, sense? Well, well, actually, see, in a way, you could look at that image and say, oh, this isn't really the attack of, of Mara. This is after he achieved enlightenment. Uh, so it, and maybe maybe that's why the dog's happy. I don't know, uh, but the earth touching gesture is when he attained enlightenment. He touched. He said, he, "The earth is my witness." So he touched the ground that the earth the earth witnessed the fact that he had achieved uh, complete freedom from samsara. So that's what, whenever you see a Buddha statue with him doing that, that's what that is. Thank you. Are there any other questions in the temple? Hi, Derek, it's Michelle. Um, first of all, it's good to see you. And um, I just want to say that, uh, well, first of all, thank you. And um, I love these these kind of teachings and this information, and it um, inspires me. So I'm really grateful for that. And um, thank you, Dirk. Thank you, Michelle. Good to see you too. So you're going to do the closing prayers, Daniel? I will. If there aren't any other questions or comments. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they, fu they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. 
please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasurer of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Songkapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losong Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think we do have a few announcements. Um, so uh, just a, a few announcements is to um, what the first one is to the, look at the Lions Roar Dharma Center website, because that has a calendar that's more accurate than what I'm going to do right now. And then um, this, uh, this Thursday breakfast, Thursday, the 23rd, the 23rd, we're having um, for Sakadawa, it's a special holiday we celebrate. Um, in honor of the Buddha's is... um, birth, enlightenment, and parinirvana. And it's a breakfast here at 6 a.m. And we take what's called uh, Mahayana precepts. That means we eat this delicious breakfast and you bring something to contribute and we share our food together. And then for that day, we don't, uh, we don't, we fast for a day. And then, um, then in a, another week uh, on the 29th, uh, um, Ling Rinpoche, who is a very special teacher who uh, is a reincarnation of the Dalai Lama's um, root teacher. He um, uh, is coming here to give a teaching on Manjushri, and it's at 7 p.m. And he, uh, this is so special that he's coming here, given that he's the Dalai Lama's um, tutor. His, um, his previous uh, incarnation was the Dalai Lama's tutor. So that's, uh, I think those are the two things, unless um, I'm going to let my friends given the other announcements. Uh, there is a Dharma Dudes meeting in the dojo after this, around like 1230-ish or so. We can mosey in there. There are snacks to lure you in if you if you feel like you're a dude and you'd like to meet with other dudes. Thank you. Oh, my God.